Good morning, Covenant City Church. Welcome to another Sunday morning where we can gather and where we could sing songs about our God, sing with one another, sing to one another of what God has done in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you guys had a restful week where we could perhaps uh, enjoy a bit of a break, the Ramadan break, and for us to be able to gather here, for us to be reminded of how good our God is and how this is meant to give us Sunday morning, Sunday worship is meant to give us rest for the Lord commands us to find rest only in Him. Uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us, perhaps today, at times we will invite uh, us to stand, to read out loud statements of faith, scripture passages together, sing songs together. It's to communicate that worship is to be done collectively, that worship is not about the band performing up on stage, but rather it's to be done together as we together be reminded by what God has done in and through His Word and Spirit. So before I invite us to uh, stand and read the call to worship together, uh, let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and mind to worship Him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this Sunday morning where we could gather, where we could be reminded of how foolish our hearts are and yet how merciful you are in Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to find rest, Lord, and help us to worship you because you deserve all of man's worship. And in fact, Lord, you made us to find our deepest fulfillment in worshiping you. For like the words of the psalmist, Father, you have made known to us the path of life that in your presence there is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Help us, Father, to believe that. Help us, Father, to find our fullness of joy and pleasures, Lord, not in earthly things, but in knowing you. And Lord, at the same time, we also admit, we also confess that our hearts love to be drawn away to so many different earthly delights. We fall to the temptations of settling for less, settling for counterfeit joys in this world. Father, we do need your word and spirit, not only on Sunday morning, but every day, to be stirred by your word, to turn away from our earthly ways, and to return to delighting in you. And Father, we can't do that alone, apart from the work of your spirit in our hearts. So would you do that? Help us, Lord, to delight, Father, in the songs we sing, in the words we read, and in the sermon that we hear today, that we could truly taste and see how beautiful you are. Remind us today of how merciful you have been to us in your Son, Lord, that though we have been unfaithful to you with our loves, you have been faithful to keep us in Christ. Would you preserve us, Lord, and would you cause our hearts to truly behold what Jesus has done for us and on our behalf. Help us now, Lord, to exalt you, and only you, Father, this morning. And to the praise and glorious name, we pray. Amen. Friends, let's now stand. Let's read out loud our call to worship today. Taken from the book of Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 6. Read out loud with me. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love of thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let us praise Him. Church, come behold. i 
Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else could whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What are the beauty demands such praises? What are the splendor outshines the sun? What are the majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy. Seems like fire. What are the power can raise the dead? What are the name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we just sung in the first two songs, Lord, to behold the wondrous mystery, to behold the holy God. Father, help us to understand what beholding you means, Lord, and not to just sing with our lips, but for our hearts to be engaged, Lord, to behold the wondrous mystery you have revealed in Jesus Christ, to re- to behold your holiness, Father, and how far we've fallen short of that, and how much we do need your mercy that you have provided in Jesus, so that we can delight, Lord, in Christ today, that all our attention and all the other objects in this world that we come easy to behold, Father, that these things may turn to, for us to behold you the one who is righteous, the one who is merciful. So help us do that as we worship you. Cause our hearts, Father, to be overwhelmed by 
what your son has done by what your spirit is doing. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Friends, the God that we worship is a jealous God. Like what we just read, we shall have no other gods than our God, and we shall not bow down or serve any man-made images of God. Why? Because the Lord our God is a jealous God. How does the jealous How does the jealousy of God inform the way that we're called to worship today or inform the way that we're called to worship Him daily? Well, a jealous God demands everything about us to belong to Him. He demands that which we ultimately treasure, revere, admire, esteem, to praise what we love and ultimately what we delight in to be Him alone. This means, friends, God is not an impersonal God who only cares about religious rituals, such as coming to church on Sunday mornings to sing the songs that we sing, to read out loud statements of faith together. But He is a personal God who actually deeply cares about what's in our hearts. Jesus says in Matthew 15 verse 8, quoting Isaiah 29, that people honor me with their lips, but their heart is actually far from me. In vain do they worship me. What a sobering reminder. What a sobering rebuke for us. I do tend to find myself going through the motions of coming on Sundays, singing the songs we sing, and not engaging what the songs that we just sung invite us to do, to behold Him and to really be overwhelmed by what Christ is calling us to do. So the question for us today as we ponder upon this What is it that in our hearts that we truly find our delight in? Do we delight in God or do we delight in the blessings of God or the things that God has given us in this world? And when these good things, the blessings of God, they are good things, but when these good things become God things in our lives, when they become the ultimate things in our lives, guess what? They have become idols. And when we do have idols, God will be jealous. And if we don't repent from idol worship, like what we just read in our call to worship, God will visit our iniquity by His wrath. And one more question, friends, for us to ponder. If God is so big and so mighty, so holy, why is He jealous? No, He's not jealous like how we normally think of a person who is jealous in this world a person who is perhaps insecure and therefore jealously needy of one's affection or attention, far from it. God is all-sufficient and doesn't need our worship. But His jealousy is not driven by His need of us, but His jealousy is driven by His hatred towards sin because He is holy. And equally important, friends, not only that He is driven by His hatred towards sin, but God's jealousy is also driven by His love. For example, you cannot truly love your spouse without feeling jealous when your spouse is in love with another person. God is jealous of us because Christ died for a people whom He calls His bride. He loves His bride so much that He is so jealous for our joy. And if there is a God-shaped hole in every human heart, God loves us enough to crush anything that tries to fill that hole that is not God alone. Jesus said in John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Do you notice, friends, that it is for our joy that He would not let any idol sit at the throne of our hearts. Friends, as we prepare for the confession of sin today, what idols, what potential idols, what are God's blessings in our lives that we perhaps treasure, that we perhaps have put at the throne of our hearts that perhaps may be provoking God to His holy anger and jealousy today? In what ways have we been settling for less, settling for counterfeit joys in this world that only God can give in Himself? I invite us to humbly confess before Him. And perhaps if you are not, perhaps if, perhaps if this question still doesn't have an answer and perhaps you're still figuring it out, pray that the Lord would reveal this in your heart, lest we provoke Him to anger with our unrepentant hearts. Let's now read out loud our confession of faith, confession of sin, taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 16 and 21, 
Read out loud with me. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With ab- they provoked him to anger. They have made me jealous with what is no god. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Lord, Lord, uh, help us now to come before you and uh, uh, be reminded of the many things that perhaps may stir you to jealousy and to stir you to anger and help us and be merciful to sinners like us, Lord, as we now confess our, as we now go into our silent prayers of confession. Dear Lord, be merciful to us, for we are still drawn to many different earthly things and distracted by them, and to believe in the promises they offer to us when they never and they can never deliver what they promise to us. Be merciful to us, Lord, so that we can truly find the true joy in life which can only be found in you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So friends, God is stirred to jealousy with our idols, and He will always be provoked to anger with our idols. Why? Because it would be unloving for Him not to be angry for that which robs us away from life's true joy, which is Himself. Unfortunately, like what Calvin said, our hearts are like idol-making factories. That it's always, this is a conquest that we face every single day until the day that the Lord calls us. And we deserve His anger and wrath, for we are all adulterers before Him. But do you know what else? And perhaps we do need to be saved from God's wrath. And that is what Christ came to do. But do you know what else that we need to be saved from? We need to be saved from our own self. And this is what wisdom that we are going through is trying to make us see. That do not put too much trust in yourself, for your hearts are deceitful. Look to Christ, look to His Word, and obey His commands, for that is good, and that is the only pathway to true joy. Fortunately, friends, God is holy but merciful in His Son, and instead of crushing us with His wrath, He crushed His Son. Instead of leaving us to live for ourselves, He made us live for Him, where true joy can be found. Here now the assurance of pardon taken from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 15, and what it says about the love of Christ and what it does in our hearts. This is God's Word. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Before we continue in our worship, Two observations from the passage we just hear today from 2 Corinthians 5. The devil would always try to deceive us, right? But Paul reminds reminds us here that first, the, the love of Christ to control us is to free us from being controlled by the lies of the devil. The devil loves to convince us that obedience to God restricts our freedom. Friends, let us not heed to the words of the enemy but to be reminded of the words of Christ today. And number two, to to no longer live for ourselves but for Christ is the only pathway to true joy, peace, and rest, not the other way around. Stop believing the lie that to live for your earthly ambitions is what will give you lasting joy and peace, for we will be constantly disappointed by the lies of the ruler of this world. Dear friends, find assurance in this today, that God is committed for your deepest joy, by protecting you from counterfeit joys that could only be found in the all-powerful, all-loving God in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, help us to see this and help us now to worship you through singing and to respond, Father, to beholding you that it was finished upon the cross and that now, Lord, we can turn from our ways and we can delight in you and we can experience true joy that can be found not in this world but in what your Son has done for us. And in his name alone we pray, Father. Amen. Friends, let's rise and sing our next song together.
The son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Death was once my great opponent. Death was once my great opponent. Fear once had. Our statement of faith today comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. I will read the question and please read aloud the answers with me. Question 95. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in the word. Thanks, Sarah. Friends, just a quick reminder why we do read statements of faith, confessions of faith together, is because they are helpful summaries of Scripture for us. Like what we just read today, it's a quick go-to reference as to what is idolatry. And what we just read today, idolatry is not kind of like just, you know, creating a statue and worshiping that statue, but idolatry is taking anything, inventing something in which one trusts, right? And we do. We can have good things and we can take them and become idols in our lives. And I think, and anything that we put that alongside of the only true God, that would be considered idolatry. And again, just uh, an encouragement for us, you know, reading this should be worshipful and I hope that it is as we are reminded continually of what God has done in and through uh, these confessions of faith. Uh, let us now continue in, in, in our worship that in our tithes and offering and giving unto CCC uh, is a duty and delight for CCC members, and I encourage us to give faithfully and joyfully for the sustaining of God's kingdom work here in our local church. But if you're not a member of CCC, please feel free to let the offering back pass by you. 
Before that, let me pray for us uh, as we prepare our hearts to give. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving this opportunity and uh, to be reminded, Lord, that none of our resources actually belong to us. And it's so easy, Lord, to look at our resources, to look at our wealth, to look at your blessings, Lord, and make them to become ultimate things in our lives. Help us, Father, to repent from that. Help us to treasure Christ, that the beauty of Christ may make all these things grow dim in light of how beautiful you are. So help us do that as we give to the praise and glory of your name alone. Amen. Let us go into our time of uh, prayer of intercession. Let us pray together. Lord, what a beautiful truth that we just sung, that you will bring us safely home. And until that day, Father, 
Would you keep us safe? Would you keep us faithful? Would you restrain our hearts from wandering too far away from you? Would you also, Father, control the desires of our hearts, the actions that we do? And in everything that we do, Father, that you may keep us safe. And help us, Lord, to find contentment. Help us to find delight in knowing that you control us. That we are not of our own, but we belong to you, our good and holy shepherd. Father, as we uh, go through the book of Proverbs, Lord, Would you also continue to help us be wise, to grow in wisdom, to grow in delighting in you, Lord, that these things that we hear and these things that we read in the book of Proverbs may not just be information that is dumped on our minds, but Father, there may be your spirit working in our hearts that we may desire wisdom, we may desire to grow more like you, that in everything that we do in our worship of you, it may be something that we get to do instead of something that we are forced to do. Be merciful to us, Lord, for we are sinners before you, for we are fleshly still in our hearts. And Father, on that note also, I pray for all of us here, for your people here, Lord, that if worshiping you is more about what's in our hearts rather than what do we do and what do we not do, Lord, would you also protect our thought life? Would you also be present in our desires, in our private lives, Lord? Would you fill our hearts with your delight, with your word daily, that our souls may truly feast and rest in who you are, Lord. Be merciful to us if we have lived our private lives in ways that dishonor you. Would you rebuke us? Would you also encourage us? Would you speak to all of us through your word and spirit today? Lord, we also think about the many programs that are happening in this church. Would you also bless them that through these programs, people may grow in deeper love of you, and deeper delight of you, Lord, and to appreciate the community that you have put us together. Praying for the leaders as well, that you may also give them rest, give them strength, endurance, Lord, as they lead Bible studies, lead community groups, engage new members, visitors, that they may do it graciously out of a place of rest as opposed from a position that they have to do it. Would you bless them, Lord? Would you give them grace? And Father, We also pray for our government. We pray for the city that we live in, that you may continue to, uh, that your justice and equity, Lord, may continue to grow in the city that we live in here today. And use our church, Lord, to be a beacon and light in this dark world. Father, we end this intercessory time in the way that you've taught your disciples to pray in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you, Elias, for leading us in liturgy today. And friends, if this is your first time here, uh, my name is Tezar. I'm one of the elders at CCC. I have a few announcements before we continue in our scripture reading and our sermon for today. If the parents could remain in the room so that you guys would get all the announcements that we, we have going on. Uh, the first one is that we do have a members meeting. So friends, if, you, if you're here and you're a member at Covenant City Church, meaning you've done a vows with an elder, uh, then we really want to encourage you to come to this members meeting. Um, we do want you guys to feel like this is your church and it's not just a top-down run church by the staff or the elders or the deacons but the members are called by god to run uh uh, his church um and a few things we'll be going to talk about there is i'm gonna ask us all to join in and pray about the city to city mission that we got going on if you guys don't know what that is it's a time where we have the opportunity um for 10 days we have about 26 uh 27 church planners that will be meeting us in bali for 10 days by us I mean, me and Sam and Yosu and some other people on staff here. Uh, and uh, we have 160 plus uh, other people who work at church in a full-time capacity. They want to just learn about what it means to be gospel-centered and how can they bring the gospel back to their church in an explicit way. So we're going to ask you guys to pray about that. Join in on that. We're going to talk about some new staff hires, exciting stuff uh, that we recently made. Uh, we're going to talk about some important community group stuff and also uh, my sabbatical plans this year and how we can plan for that, because 
come what may, it will happen, okay, uh, sometime this year. So we'll talk about all that stuff. So we'd love you members to come and join uh, in those discussions. Second announcement is that we have the men's and women's Bible study. Please take advantage of that. It's going to be hard for you to feel like you're plugged in or um, be encouraged in the word if all the feeding you do is on Sunday mornings. Okay, you need to be exposed to God's word throughout, throughout the week. Uh, for men, the Bible studies will uh, go on from April 23rd to June 5th. For the women, from April 20th to June 22nd. And uh, it will be online and somewhere in person. If you want to know the details of which group is which, go to Planning Center and check out all the groups there. Um, and the deadline to register is today. Okay, so if you want to be part of that, really, really encourage you to, to register today. Um, and uh, I want to invite uh, Prisca for the Women Fellowship Announcement. And then after that, I have one more. And then uh, we'll continue in our scripture reading and sermon for the day. Or Eunice. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we wa I want to invite all uh, the women, ladies here, to join us to go to Kebun Raya Bogor. It's going to be in two weeks on Saturday. It's a half-day uh, event. We'll do... Uh, a bit of reflection, devotion time in the beginning, and then we're going to walk around Kebun Raya Bogor enjoying the fresh uh, nature views and also just conversations with uh, fellow ladies in this uh, community. Um, please sign up. It's on uh, Church Center. The last day to register is Friday, this Friday. So, uh, yeah, see you guys there, hopefully. Thanks. All right, thank you, Eunice. And one more uh, for me. Guys, we do have volunteer opening and signups. We're growing as a church. We need your help uh, in, in many of the ministries here. Women's ministry, children's ministry, servant team, uh, uh, other servant teams available. So please uh, sign up for that. Um, and also, if you're a new member at CCC, you would have received an email at some point for the recent members. Uh, I, I think you filled them out or uh, filled that document. Check that email again, and there'll be options of what ministries you want to serve in. Please help us out. We're, we're in need of, of a lot more help to serve the people that God has given us today. And also for members, uh, if you want lunch for the members meeting next week uh, on April 21st, um, it'll be, I don't know if I announced the time, it'll be after church uh, at lunchtime uh, here in the same room next Sunday. If you want lunch, please sign up through um, the planning center as well, okay, that you want lunch for that. Okay. All right. Uh, if you want to bring your children to the Sunday school, you can uh, go to the door through my left, and the rest of you who are still here, if you could rise for a minute and greet each other in the name of the Lord as we give the parents time to come back and join us for the sermon. Sorry, also, if you have children on the upper junior class, you can go to my right. Okay, upper junior class children, go to my right. Student ministry, go to my left. Okay, uh, friends, let's try and give our parents time to come back from dropping off their kids. Uh, let me pray for us, and then hopefully they'll be back by the time uh, the sermon and scripture reading begins. All right, let's pray. Father Lord, we come to you, and we do ask that you be gracious to your children today who are trying their best to understand eternal, inerrant truths from your scripture, uh, and to make it a little bit more difficult, I guess, uh, it is in a genre that's not easily intuitive and understandable by us, which is uh, poetry. 
which is what the book of Proverbs is. Help us read this poem. Help us understand this proverb in such a way that we truly get the intent of the original author behind it, Solomon, but also understand uh, the, the intent of the divine author, who is you, um, as you try and communicate to us the beauties of your redemption plan, uh, the glory of Christ, and the purpose of our lives as we now see things that we might have not seen before uh, if we didn't use your word to be a lamp and a light to our feet. Help us now, Father, open up your word and fall in deeper love with you as we also grow in knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so friends, uh, welcome again. Today we are continuing in our sermon series through the book of Proverbs. We're currently at the end of Proverbs chapter 6, okay? And as we'll see, Solomon here at the end of chapter 6, he's still talking about the same thing, the same theme uh, that he's been talking about in the past few chapters. And that is the importance of our battle and our struggle against sin, okay? That's kind of been the main theme he's been talking about uh, from chapter 5. But here again, he kind of approaches this same theme with a bit of a different angle, a different twist. If at the end of chapter five, Solomon helps us resist sin by reordering the passions and desires of our hearts, okay? He reorders the passions of our hearts and then at the, end of, at the beginning of chapter six, Solomon helps us struggle and battle against sin uh, by revealing to us the futility of our worldly pursuits how it won't give you what you think it will, okay? Now, here at the end of chapter six, Solomon is still helping us resist sin and fight sin, but he's doing it by correcting our view of reality. That's kind of the angle he's, he's going with in this passage. He's helping us fight and struggle and battle sin by correcting our view of reality. See, every single one of us here, whether we realize it or not, we all have a view of reality. And our view of reality, whether we realize it or not, plays a huge role in directing our lives, in uh, helping us make decisions, in dictating how we feel about certain situations. All that stuff you got going on outside of you is actually controlled by something inside of you, which is your view of, of life, of, of reality. And what Solomon's saying in our passage today is that if you want to be able to fight sin well, you got to let God's word, in other words, you got to let the Bible shape your view of reality. See, you must let the Bible not only help your ears hear God's commands. It's a big difference. You must let the Bible not only help your ears hear God's commands. You must let the Bible help our eyes see the world through God's reality. And it sounds like a small difference, but it's a huge difference because if you see the world through God's reality, what this will do is it will allow you to avoid sin more effectively. How so? Well, let me ask you, what would make you stop walking faster? Seeing a fire pit that's in front of you with your own eyes or hearing someone from a distance say stop? What would make you stop quicker? Probably seeing the fire pit that's in front of you with your own eyes, right? That'll make you stop quicker. Now, okay, sure, the stopping might just be a split second quicker. But that split second of a difference, Solomon is saying here, especially when you encounter sins that are sexual in nature. That split second difference in your decision-making could be the difference between living a full life and a ruined one. Some of us here know people whose lives have been ruined by that split second of a difference. And some of us perhaps have ourselves been affected by or tasted the ruin of that split second of a difference. How can we develop a quicker response time in repentance to avoid falling into potential life-shattering pitfalls, even though it may be just a split second of a difference? And how can we have hope if perhaps we have found ourselves fallen too deep into one of these pitfalls ourselves? Okay, 
Let's get into it. This is God's word. Take from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 35. Again, it's a long one, so stick with me as I read the whole thing. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you wake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he's caught, he'll pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious, for he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. Thus says the Lord. Here's what I think Solomon's point is from our passage today. He wants to tell us that if we interpret reality, if we view life through God's word, one, we'll see the world as it really is. Two, we'll see many pitfalls once hidden. And three, we'll see a furious God we could never appease. Okay? We'll see the world as it really is. We'll see many pitfalls once hidden, and we'll see a furious God we could never appease. Let's start the first point. If we view reality or life through God's word, we'll see the world as it really is. Okay. So Solomon opens up this proverb with his familiar introduction that he always uses, right, in the book of Proverbs. My son, he says in verse 20, Keep your father's commandments and forsake not your mother's teaching. But we know from the past five chapters that the father and mother's teaching here has simply been about what? God's word, right? That's what they've been passing down to the son. So what Solomon's telling the son here is to not forsake God's word, God's wisdom, the Bible, the scriptures. Bind them on your heart, he says. Tie them around your neck. Keep them close to you. Why? Because they will lead you, he says in verse 22. They will watch over you. They will guide you, direct you. But here's what's interesting. If we go on, we'll see how God's word will lead and watch over and guide us. How will God's word do that? Solomon says in verse 23. God's word will lead, watch over, and guide us by being a lamp and a light. Okay, that's the focus here. A lamp and a light. Now, I want to invite you to think about this. How do lamps and lights guide us? They don't guide us um, by giving verbal commands, do they? Right? A lamp doesn't verbally say, hey, turn around. There's a wall in front of you. That's not what lights do. What do they do? They shine a light and they reveal the wall that's in front of you. They show you your surrounding. They show you how the world really is so that you would stop on your own and turn around, not because somebody told you to, but because you don't want a broken nose. You see? Um, Lights guide us in in a different way. It's a different kind of guiding. Have you guys ever tried playing one of those uh, VR goggle games? You know what I'm talking about? With With the... Virtual reality goggles, they kind of put on your face and you kind of feel like you're immersed in the game, right? You're in the world of the game. Um, I tried playing it once. I was brought to this place and I guess this place was kind of introducing this VR concept to the people in the area. Um, And you had to like buy a ticket to go in. And there's this big room and I had a friend in there that we kind of wanted to go together. Uh, So I bought a ticket, went into this big room and there were tons of people with VR goggles on kind of playing this game. 
And for our safety, we had instructors in the room who were kind of guiding us with their words, right? They were telling us, you know, hey, stop, don't go there, don't turn left, don't swing, come back, right? We needed somebody to do that for our own safety because none of us were actually aware of our real surroundings. We were all making decisions based on the fake realities that were presented to us through these VR goggles. And I remember very clearly, at one point, I heard one of these instructors tell me to stop, like a few times. He said, stop, stop, don't move forward. But I completely ignored him. I, I heard him loud and clear, but I ignored him. You know why? Because at that point, I was racing three different goblins toward the finish line. And I wasn't about to lose to no goblins, okay? So I kept running. I was just, I was going, I didn't hear him, and I was about to hit a wall. But thankfully, another instructor stopped me, took the VR goggles off of me, and showed me the wall that was in front of my face. And I immediately stopped. Showing me the wall that's in front of my face turned out to be a more effective way to make me stop than the words, stop. This, I think, is what Solomon is trying to tell the son here. This, this, is what, this is how Solomon is saying God's word should work. Yes, God's word should be a verbal guide of sorts uh, that tells us to stop. Right? We, we read the words, don't do this, don't do that. But it should also work as a lamp that takes off our VR goggles, so to speak, and illuminate to us, reveal to us the many walls in the room that we would have hit otherwise and not seen. And this is so important. Why? Because sometimes we're just too immersed in our own little fake realities, aren't we? To where the verbal command, stop, in itself won't stop us. This is the context that Solomon is giving us in verses 20 to 23 before he reintroduces to us a character in verse 24 that he already introduced in chapter 5, who is the adulterous married woman. Remember this woman from chapter 5? She's a married woman who takes pleasure in seducing other people's husbands with her smooth tongue and her beautiful eyes, Solomon says in verse 24 to 25. See, my son, he's saying, when you lay eyes on this woman, he says, I know what you see. What you see is a very beautiful woman. What you see is the pair of the most captivating eyes you've ever looked upon. That's what you see. And everything in you is saying she's the answer. Everything in you is saying she's the answer. She's the finish line. If I can just run full speed toward her, then the evil goblins of loneliness and insecurity and shame and insignificance and mediocre mundane living will finally leave me alone. If I can just get there, I'll finally be happy. Sure, all my friends say stop. Sure, God's word says stop. Sure, the pastor on Sunday said stop. I hear them all, loud and clear. But you don't want to stop, do you? Solomon asked his son. You don't. You want to keep running toward her full speed. You want to keep pursuing her with all that you have. I know you do. And not because you don't hear people saying stop. Because the goblins are too scary. And the finish line, too seductive. You are way too immersed right now. You are in way too deep. What you need is something louder than words. What you need is for God's word to take off the fake reality goggles you've got on and be a lamp and a light so that you can see this woman for who she really is. Not a finish line. Oh, no. Not the answer to all of your problems, not the thing that'll make all the goblins go away, but a raging fire. Solomon says in verse 27 and 28, 
are, you are running towards a raging fire that'll burn all your clothes off and scorch your skin the second you touch her. Which leads us to our second point. Keeping God's word close to our hearts will help us see the world as it is and direct us by revealing many of the unforeseen pitfalls. Okay. So in the next part of this proverb, it's going to feel a bit disconnected, but we'll connect it soon, okay? In, in the next part of this proverb, Solomon does something interesting. He compares the crime of committing marital adultery with the crime of prostitution in verse 26 and with the crime of theft in verse 30. Those are the two crimes he compares marital adultery with, okay? And here's a summary of what he's saying. He's saying, look, that if you get caught, uh, if you get caught up in prostitution or in theft, there is a payment you can make, legally at least, to get out of it, okay? There's a payment you can make to break even, so to speak. If you get caught up in prostitution, he says there, um, you might could pay a loaf of bread and the debt collectors won't come looking for you. That's what he says in verse 26. Or if you get caught stealing something from someone, you could also pay, the back, uh, pay back the person you stole from. Now it might cost you sevenfold, he says in verse 31, right? Meaning you might, you might have to pay him back up to seven times worth of what you stole. But the point is there's still a way out. There is still a monetary value you can pay to quote unquote break even. Now before I move on, I do have to emphasize you know, pretty clearly that this is poetry, right? It's a poem. So Solomon isn't here in any way justifying or condoning, you know, uh, prostitution or, or, or theft. That's not what he's doing, okay? All he's trying to do is make a point about marital adultery. And the point is this. With marital adultery, unlike with these other two crimes, you can't just pay it back <laughs> with loaves of bread or with any other asset that you have. If you get caught committing marital adultery, Solomon says at the end of verse 26, take a look at it, you're going to have to pay it back with what? With your precious life. Which, by the way, was the legal consequence of marital adultery back then. Uh, the family, uh, the spouse and the kids of the person you committed adultery with can legally make you their slave for the rest of your life you will be enslaved to that woman's husband for the rest of your life, Solomon's saying here. And no matter what you pay him, he continues in verses 33, 35. Take a look at that. No matter what gift you offer him, he will not let you off the hook ever. His jealous wrath will never be satisfied, he says in verse 34. Why? He, here's the point. Why can't you pay this husband back with monetary goods like with the two other crimes. Why won't material goods, in this case, make it break even? Because what you stole from this man wasn't anything material. What you broke in this man was much more precious than money. What you robbed him of was honor, what you stole from him was dignity. What you broke was his joy, his sanity. What you betrayed was purity and righteousness and goodness and unity and truth. What you desecrated was love itself, not anything material. And that's why what he'll require of you in verse 33 isn't anything material either. But what? Wounds of dishonor, it says. An ending disgrace that your money can never wipe away. You ever experience someone taking from you something that money can't replace? You ever experience someone breaking in you something that can't be measured with monetary value? Hmm? You ever experienced someone robbing you from something that can't be paid back with silver or gold? When you commit marital adultery, Solomon's saying here, that's what you're doing. 
you're breaking and stealing something that can't be measured or repaid with money, and you could have avoided it. Maybe you, you might have stopped if you just allowed the lamp of God's word to light up your reality. If you allowed the lamp of God's word to light up your reality, you would have known. You would have seen that what you were sprinting towards wasn't a beautiful woman. What you were running towards wasn't the answer to all of your problems. What you would have seen yourself running towards is a precious glass room that contained within it all things good and beautiful. Things like honor and dignity and purity and righteousness and truth and goodness and justice and trust and love and family and unity and respect and you ran straight to it and shattered it all. You desecrated all that is true, good and beautiful and you could never pay back what you destroyed with money because what you broke wasn't money. I don't care how much you have. What you destroyed, what you stole, what you shattered by running towards that woman was eternally priceless things. And you would have stopped. I mean, maybe, just maybe, there would have been that split second of a decision that split second of a difference. If only God's word lit up your reality, took your VR goggles off, and showed you what it is you're actually running toward. Not beauty. Not love. Not joy. Not hope. Not peace. But the destruction of them. And by the way, if you're here today and you haven't committed marital adultery, don't get too prideful just yet, okay? This isn't just about marital adultery, is it? Like all of Solomon's poems, this is about sin in general. Sin in general works in the same exact way, doesn't it? Think about it. Why do we run full speed into sin? Because our world hasn't yet been illuminated by God's word. We still view life through the lenses of our own little virtual reality. So we don't see things as they are. We see financial fraud as the answer to our anxiety. So we sprint to it. We see it as the answer to our anxiety, not as a destruction of integrity. We see sexual deviance of any sort as the answer to our stress, not as the desecration of purity. We see anger as the way to uphold justice, not as the annihilation of unity. We see gossip and slander as the solution for our own insecurities and not as the death of someone else's dignity. They're fake finish lines because you're looking at life through fake realities. So we sprint toward those things full speed and we ignore all the voices that say stop because we don't see them for what they are the desecration of priceless and precious things of God that existed longer than the universe itself. That's what you're destroying. We don't see that. But what's more worrisome, perhaps, is that what we don't see as, as we do this, as we run straight toward these things, what we don't see is that we're actually also running straight toward the hands of a furious God. Which brings us to our last point. When God's word illuminates our reality, we'll see the world as it is, we'll see many pitfalls once hidden, and we'll see a furious God that we could never appease. Earlier I said in the passage that this isn't just about uh, offending a jealous husband whose wrath will never end. This is about sin in general. This is ultimately about offending a holy God whose wrath will also never end. But why do I say that? Well, because, and this is interesting, Solomon here in this proverb actually uses uh, a certain word or a few words that clearly echo God's own words in commandment number 10 in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. You remember that? You remember what God, who knows what God said in the Ten Commandment? Do not 
covet your neighbor's wife, okay? If you go to verse 25, read verse 25, and, and you see the word desire there. See, Solomon says, do not desire her beauty. That word desire is actually literally the same Hebrew word translated to covet in the 10th commandment. It's the same Hebrew word. In the 10th commandment, it's translated to covet. Here it's translated to desire. Don't know why. So literally, what Solomon's saying here is that you must not covet her beauty. Whose beauty? Go down to verse 29. The beauty of who? Your neighbor's wife. In other words, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Now, this might sound like a stretch to some, but two of the main commentaries I use on this textbook agree, and I also, also lean toward this, that there's a clear echo here of the 10th commandment reminding the son, once again, of whose words, whose wisdom is the father passing down to him here? It's not his own. Whose wisdom is it? It's God's wisdom. These are God's commandments. These are God's words. Honor, dignity, purity, truth, righteousness, goodness, justice, trust, love, family, unity, respect, those are all things dear, not just the husband's heart, but to God's heart. And if you break them, if you shatter these things because you're making foolish life decisions based on your own little virtual realities, God's fury will burn hot against you. And like the jealous husband here, he will not spare his revenge. He won't accept any compensation from you. He will refuse all of your gifts. He will heap upon you wounds of dishonor and disgrace until he consumes you with the same commitment and intentionality that the jealous husband here has for you taking his wife. Okay, you know what kind of preaching I hate the most? The kind of preaching I hate the most is um, the fire, hell, and brimstone kind of preaching. You know what I'm talking about? The one I just did for the past 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because it, it, it relies too much on guilt and shame to make people change. And I don't think that's the way the Bible makes people change. But hear me out, okay? Um, we can't let those bad uh, fire, hell, brimstone kind of sermons we've experienced in the past make us overly resistant to passages like this, which do emphasize the fury of God as a motivation to stop. If you want to have a God who loves honor and dignity and purity and righteousness and goodness and justice and integrity and love, if you want to have a God that loves those things, you also have to have a God who hates the desecration of those things with the same intensity. You can't have one without the other. His love for those things must be matched by his wrath towards their destruction. Therefore, God's wrath too not just God's love and honor and purity and righteousness and goodness, but God's wrath too is as real as a chair you're sitting on and has existed longer than the universe itself. But you know how crazy we are? <laughs> this is how crazy we are, okay? If you didn't know. Most of us, we know this, don't we? We've been Christians for years. You've been coming to church for years. You've been hearing sermons for years. You've been hearing preachers, good or bad, scare, you know, the living hell out of you, literally, <laughs> right? You've heard that over and over again. But for some reason, though we hear that the things we're running towards and some of the things we keep going back to, we hear that those things awaken the fear of God loud and clear, we just keep running towards them. We just keep going back to them. Why? Why? Because we're immersed too deep in our own realities, the fake finish lines are too seductive, and this is where a lot of us just kind of give up. You know, we say, look, Tez, I've heard this, I've been a Christian my whole life, um, I've heard these warnings my whole life, but I just still don't say re see real change in me. I'm still running towards these things, you know, towards anger, towards lying, towards sexual deviance, towards envy, towards gossip. God's wrath isn't stopping me. I see it, I hear it. I guess I'm just hopeless, we think to ourselves. I mean, if God's wrath isn't going to stop me, right, what will? Well, what if I tell you there's something even louder than God's wrath that might make you stop? What if I tell you there's something even more effective in making you change uh, the palate of your heart? What is it? It's his forgiveness. 
This is the last thing I'll point out. I try not to put too much on the third point, but I think this is worth it. Another phrase we see in this proverb uh, that's echoed a lot also in the Old Testament is the phrase in verse 33, is the phrase wiped away. You see that? Solomon there in verse 33 describes the sinner's fate, and he says that his disgrace will not be wiped away. The Old Testament actually uses that same phrase in many other places, but interestingly, it uses it in other places in a much more hopeful way. For example, in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, it says that the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach or the shame of his people. Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to the abundant mercy wipe away my transgressions. Isaiah 42, uh, 44, verse 22, God said, I have wiped away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Okay, so apparently there is a way to appease the fear of this husband. There, there, there is a way to wipe away the disgrace of the sinner. But how? I, I thought you said that the things we broke were eternally precious things that can't be paid back with, with silver or gold. Well, let me read to you, friends. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. The apostle Peter said this. He said, you are ransomed. You're forgiven. From the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver and gold. But with what? With the precious blood of Christ. You are absolutely right. The things we've broken in our sin, what we've shattered were things more valuable than what our money and silver could ever pay back. And that's why God paid it off with something much more precious. That's why on that cross, Jesus received the wounds of our dishonor. That's why on that cross, Jesus received the reproach of our disgrace. Paid. Wiped away. So now you know what you have. You have new lenses to view life through. They're called lenses of settled debt. Lenses of settled debt. And maybe these are the lenses you need in order to stop your sinful pursuits. You gotta see not just the potential destruction and wrath you're walking toward. You also gotta see a crucified savior all the way on the other side. Maybe that's what's gonna make you turn 180 degrees, which is what repentance means, by the way, a turning 180 degrees, because you see not just one thing, but two things. You see not just the fury you're heading towards, but you also see the open arms of a crucified Savior who took on hell's fury for you, standing on the opposite direction. That's louder than the wrath of God is the cross of Christ. Now, friends, let me, leave, let me leave us with this. Don't be discouraged, you know, if it's taking a while for you. Just like our eyes might need a second to settle in once a lamp has been turned on in a dark room, our spiritual eyes, too, maybe, need a minute to adjust viewing the world through the light of God's Word. But Solomon here is saying, Keep binding his word upon your heart. You must keep tying it around your neck. You must expose yourself to it every day. Study it, read it, sing it, memorize it, meditate on it. Listen to biblically faithful sermons. Go to community groups. Get plugged into these Bible studies that we're offering. Don't slack in your personal devotion. Whatever you do, fight with your life to put on lenses of settled debt every day. 
And it might just give you that split second of a difference when it matters most between living a full life and a ruined one. Let's pray. There's so many things, Father, I know in my life. There's so many split seconds that could have, would have, should have, but didn't. And now our lives is where it is. Will you please, by your spirit, open our goggles off and reveal to us the most important and loud thing we could ever see. And that is a savior drenched in his own blood, more pure and righteous and valuable than anything we own. And as we do so, Father, help those who are here who might find themselves in pits way too deep already, see themselves cleansed, see their sins truly wiped away. And may those here who might be about to fall into some of these pitfalls be protected from it. And may those who are not anywhere near any pitfalls continue to be distanced from them as they navigate and walk through life through the lamp and the light of your word. The lamp and the light that shows us reality through the lenses of settled debt. In the name of Christ, the one who settled our debts, and in his name alone, we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite us to rise and we sing this last song together and reflect upon the depth of our Father's love for us. Amen. How deep the Father's, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make the wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory
His words have paid my ransom. Friends, I hope we're reminded today that we are in a spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is less about exorcisms, but it is more about what we choose to delight in our hearts and minds. And we have been presented a challenge today to see and walk in this world according to our human ways or according to God's Word. The former may look appealing and appetizing to our eyes and desires, but they are pitfalls and traps by the devil to destroy us. But the latter, to see the world through God's Word, may look boring and basic to our eyes and appetite in the moment, reading Scripture daily, obeying God's commands, fellowshipping with the saints, saying no to the sinful delights of this world, resisting our idols. But friends, that is the pathway to true joy in life. How do we win our battles, friends? Not to fight harder, but to run to the love of the Father and to cling to Christ. And though we lose battles, and we will, friends, Christ has won the war of ransoming our souls from sin by His own precious blood. Run to Jesus, brothers and sisters. Receive now our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in His peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, 